Well, top of the morning to you. I was just uh, thinking this morning, back when I was in elementary school, if you forgot to wear green on St. Patrick's Day, it gave permission to all the other kids to pinch you. you know? Now, in this day of Me Too and uh, political correctness, I, I wouldn't advise that, but you can tell somebody you're offended. Uh, that seems to be perfectly well uh, acceptable. Well, we're glad you're here for this second Sunday of, uh, of Lent. We're um, traveling the crossroad. Uh, we're traveling to the cross, the way of Jesus. And, uh, you know, discovering along the way that, uh, you know, his way is not the easy way, but uh, it's the way, the way of the cross. It's the way of truly following him. And uh, so today we're going to... to hear uh, about uh, crossover and uh, what that means for our, our uh, walk with Christ. Well, let's get ready to worship as we hear a prelude, and uh, let's just focus on the Lord Jesus.
seed hath trod, with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God. Ere we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a Good morning. As we gather at that river to pray, would you all please stand and join me in the call to worship? Sometimes it seems as though God is far away. There is so much trouble in the world. We look to the heavens and wonder why God doesn't deal more strictly with the wicked and more compassionately with the innocent. We are overwhelmed with the needs of others. Come, let us turn to the Lord, whose very heart is compassion and hope. Let us walk the way of the cross and be partners with Christ in caring for all who are in need. Amen. In our opening hymn, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
please bow with me in prayer. God, as we continue our Lenten journey, help us to use this time to sweep out the corners of our lives where sin has accumulated, grown, and allow us to uncover the ways we have strayed from your truth. Help us to hear your invitation anew to follow you and give us the strength to make radical obedience to your way, what defines our lifestyle. Help us now to please and to honor you with our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome a friend in faith uh, somewhere near you. And... Morning, morning. Morning, morning. Morning, morning. Welcome our children to come on up. I think that would be Benjamin. Good morning, Benjamin. So, when you see me wearing a hat like this, you know two things, right? First, Pastor Tom is a dork. And what else do you know? It's St. Patrick's Day. That's right. Now, have you ever thought about um, who is this guy that they would name a, an Irish holiday after? Do you, do you know anything about St. Patrick? Um, not too much. Yeah, and, and really nobody does because he lived clear back in the 5th century. You know, he was, uh, he was a, a young man that... Uh, that uh, Grew up and uh, actually, uh, well, let me back up. Uh, there, there's there's a lot of uh, uh, legends that have grown up around Saint Patrick. You know, one is that uh, he uh, he ordered all the snakes to leave Ireland, um, but they tell us that wasn't exactly true. That there weren't any snakes to begin with. But uh, but nevertheless, uh, and the other thing is. Um, Officially, you know, we call him St. Patrick, but apparently um, he was never canonized as a saint. In other words, the, the church never voted on him. Hey, you know, we vote this guy a, a saint. But, uh, but yet he was a, an incredible person, you know, and, and really a saint, a saint is anybody that the light shines through, don't you think? Yeah, and it certainly did through St. Patrick. Well, what we do know is true about St. Patrick is, uh, I mean, maybe the sh most shocking part is that he wasn't really Irish. Uh, he didn't, he wasn't born there. Uh, he was born in Scotland, but when he was about six years old, there was a, a raiding party that came into Scotland from Ireland, and he was captured, 16 year old, and he was kidnapped and taken back to uh, Ireland and served basically as a slave to one of the uh, Celtic uh, chiefs back there. And um, they made him, um, for about five years, he watched sheep. There are a lot of sheep in Ireland and uh, a lot of sheep to watch. So uh, he, he had a lot of time on his hands. And he hadn't been really that interested in God before that, but uh, during that time, he spent a lot of time in prayer. When he was about 21, he escaped, and he made his way back to Scotland. But when he was there, um, eventually God was working on his heart to uh, go back to Ireland to teach uh, those people about God. Now, if you had been kidnapped as a 16-year-old and drug away to this land and you escaped, would you go back? I'm not sure I would either, unless, unless it was really clear from, that God wanted me to do that. You know? and, and, and for St. Patrick, it, it apparently was very clear. And so he went back to his former captives and he began teaching them about effective you know there had been some others who had come and tried to spread Christianity in Ireland before that but 
But Patrick went straight to the the, the chiefs of the clans, you know. The, and the, the, the story is, and maybe it's just another one of the legends, but maybe it's true that one of the first persons that he converted to Christianity was the chief who he was a slave to before. And that, that's pretty neat, isn't it? So, so Patrick was a guy who, who kind of walked toward the pain of his past to, to, uh, to do God's work. And it, and it really makes you think that Patrick was, was following in what we're talking about, the, the crossroad. He's following in the way of Jesus because you know, Jesus did that too, didn't he? he? He knew the cross was going to be horrible, but yet you know, he walked toward the pain. He, he, he went to the cross, even though he had the power to, to escape it. And he did that for us. And so uh, when we think about... Uh, following Jesus today. You know, we're going to be looking at a story in the Bible today where some people kind of walked around those in need, but, um, but walking in the way of Jesus is, is walking toward the pain, um, doing God's work in spite of how you know, frightened we might be of it or how much we would like to avoid uh, some unpleasant things. But uh, it's the way of, way of the cross, and, uh, and God calls each of us to, to go down that way. So we should celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day in a big way. Uh, maybe not the way it's celebrated today, but uh, there's some really good, good reasons to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. So let's have a prayer together. God, we're so thankful to, for this day to remember uh, uh, one of your saints, somebody uh, that the light shone through. And uh, and. Lord, we're just amazed that uh, Patrick was um, willing to go back to those who had tormented him, who had uh, robbed some years from his life, and yet he went back and he, uh, he taught them uh, the forgiveness of God. And so, uh, Lord, help us to have that same kind of heart as we follow Jesus, as we do the, uh, the hard things, sometimes when, when God calls us to do it. So uh, help us to be obedient, just like Patrick was. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all this morning? Look at that sunshine. Um, I think I mentioned to a couple people what we um, lack in temperature. We've made up for in beautiful sunshine this morning. So we'll, it, we'll take that as a win today. It is wonderful to see you all here and welcome. Um, if you're visiting with us today for the first time, um, certainly want to make sure we extend a welcome to you. Um, and we do ask a couple things of you. One, could you please fill out the yellow um, visitor information sheet uh, or card in the pew rack in front of you? Drop that in the plate when it comes by. And two, and more importantly, please take a second after the service um, and go out in the fellowship hall and hang out with us for a minute. Let us get to know you a little bit, and dare I say, um, get to know us as well. Um, just have a cup of coffee or some juice or tea or whatever it is you like. We would love to um, spend a little extra time with you this morning. Um, I want to say hello to all the people out there on the live stream this morning. Good morning. Great to see you there. If you get a second, um, please drop us a hello in the comments. We would love to hear from you and know that you're out there as well. Um, I do have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, did anybody think that the children's moments went a little long this morning in the hopes that I, I would forget the part at the beginning of Pastor Tom and the hat? Um, but I'm not going for low-hanging fruit, so... <laughs> Um, I have a few announcements to um, hit you with. Um, the first couple are not in your bulletin, so please, um, I know you try to tune me out, but pay attention to this. Um, on the 30th, which is um, not next Saturday, but the following Saturday, um, we are going over to Salem United Methodist Church. Now, I, I said something to you last week about this being for the men's group. This is going to be our hope on the go for the entire church um, from the mission team. So, if you would like to come over and help us out, we have so many things to do over there. We have cleaning, painting, um, plumbing. Uh, I mean, we don't even know what we're going to get into yet. Um, we have a list of things and jobs that we're going to be working on, um, and there is something for everyone to do. Um, 
If there's anybody here with a particular fondness for carpet scrubbing, boy, have we got something for you. Um, so uh, we have a little bit of everything to do. And um, right now, I think we're planning on going over there. We'll get together here at 9 o'clock on the 30th. And we'll come back um, probably, I'm not sure, between 1 and 2. Um, some of these projects are going to take a little time, and we can't kind of leave them in the middle. So uh, we want to make sure we get as much done as we can over there. We are going to be working with a few people from Salem, so we will get to know those people as well. Uh, it's not just one of those things where we go and help out and never get to see what happens um, and never get to meet the people that are affected. So this is going to be a, a really big deal for our church and um, certainly for Salem and we want to make this a continuing relationship. Uh, we don't have a sign-up sheet up yet, um, but if you are interested, just come tell me, and I'll write your name down on a piece of paper and make sure it gets on the sign-up sheet. So now, when you're all tired and worn out from working at Salem, we're going to give you a chance to restretch your muscles on the 31st. Um, this is a tentative date to do some painting work over in the child care center. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they have planned over there, but there will be some, it's just painting. Um, so if you are interested in that, also please let me know and we will make sure that um, we have a brush with your name on it. So um, from the bulletin, I just wanna highlight the um, Walk With Easter Family Easter event on April 6th. Um, that's from two to four. And this is gonna be a really special event. This is gonna be something for all ages. Um, it's similar to, but different from, the um, Road to Resurrection thing we did a couple years back that um, um, was really a lot of fun and really very um, spiritually enlightening as well for a lot of folks. So um, please mark that time on your calendars and we will um, look forward to seeing you there. And we are always looking for volunteers to participate in that event at some level. Um, the only other thing I wanna make sure you take a look at, and um, I'm just gonna point it out to you, that's your Easter flower order form from the District United Methodist Men. Um, take a look at that if you would like to order some flowers for Easter. Um, please do so, you can um, either fill out the form, wrap your check in it, put it in the plate, or you can put it in the secretary's mailbox right next to the church office. Um, folks, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Definitely some joyful opportunities in this church. Um, and now is the time of our service where we get to share uh, what is on our hearts, our joys and our concerns with our fellow believers in Christ. Please state your name, wait for the microphone, and share with your family. Hi, I'm Brian Scott. I um, just wanted to share joy. I'm sure everyone heard about the false alarm at U of M yesterday. Aaron and the band was up there, and I guess they said that um, the band had made it back to the hotel before that scare, but just pray that everything was turned out great and... Also, Erin let me know that she's been nominated for MVP for the year in her broomball team. And I told her, I, I said, well, that's great. I said, I hear the Walleye are looking for a really good goalie too. And she said, no, Dad. Zimmerman. Um, I recently uh, was made aware of uh, one of our former members, Jim Baxter, recently passed away. Um, he just passed away and the um, services are pending, but um, we all love that family so much. So um, prayers with all the kids and everything. And um, also prayer for those people that are missing in our pews today because they're down at hurricane, uh, excuse me, the um, Hurricane Katrina, still cleaning up, like Jimmy said, 11 years later. So um, be with them and um, it's crazy what they're gonna get into because I've been there, 
but praise them for going and giving of their time. And um, you know what? They have a lot of fun, too. <laughs> Bye-bye. Lori Schofield, I saw Carol Rittenauer yesterday. Bill is home. He's healing slowly. He appreciates the prayers and would love them to continue. Uh, good morning. Joyce Aldred Fine. Many of you remember my sister-in-law in England, um, Sally Aldred. It was with great sorrow that I heard this week that her daughter, Sarah, 49 years old, just dropped dead very, very suddenly. She was on vacation on the island of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, and she just called for her husband and died there and then. So it's taken a few days to get her, her the body and her husband back to England for services, and it will be uh, done at the local crematorium on April the 8th. So I'm asking for prayers for Sally, Dave, and their two remaining boys. Thank you. If there are no others, we'll ask. Tom to lead us in prayer. Let's bow and pray. Oh God, we've been made aware this week of uh, just how unpredictable um, life is and how uh, how dangerous it seems our world is uh, many times. Uh, Lord, we're, we are thankful that uh, members of our, our band are okay and everybody else is too. Thank you that, thank, we are thankful that that was a false alarm. But Lord, we also lift up the, the people of New Zealand in Christ Church where this terrible massacre has taken place this week. And Lord, we just pray for these families who have um, lost loved ones in this very senseless act of violence. We just uh, pray for uh, for the love of your people to uh, to just touch lives and uh, to affirm um, the goodness that uh, can exist uh, as God's love flows through us instead of instead of the hate um, that is experienced by many. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we pray also today for the, the Baxter family and the loss of Jim. We pray for uh, Joyce's uh, sister-in-law Sally's family, the loss of this uh, dear daughter so suddenly. And uh, Lord, for, for each family, we pray for your uh, comfort, and we pray for uh, uh, just a time of uh, closeness for these families and a time of, uh, to celebrate these lives in the midst of their grief. Lord, we lift up our, uh, our servants uh, who have gone down to uh, continue the work uh, at Hurricane Katrina Relief at uh, New Orleans. And we just pray for them and their, uh, their work and also, Lord, in their travel back home. Uh, keep them safe. Keep them uh, joyfully witnessing to, uh, to your love and uh, as they serve others. Um, we rejoice too, Lord, uh, in Bill Rittenauer's uh, being able to come home again. And uh, Lord, we just pray that uh, he'll be able to stay there this time. And uh, so we just pray for your healing touch to just uh, bring Bill back to full health again. Um, we also pray today, Father, for, for each other as we uh, 
sense those in this room. We just pray for uh, your touch to be upon their lives. We pray uh, continually, uh, Lord, for our brother Tyler Yoder, and uh, just pray that you continue to be, help and sustain him and uh, help him each day, Lord, to, to gain strength and to feel better. We pray, Father, during this season of Lent that this would be a time of, uh, of spiritual growth for us. And so, uh, Lord, help us to be attentive uh, to the things uh, of the soul and to uh, make this time a time of, of consciously um, walking in your path and learning what that means. Guide us in this endeavor, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Savior risked all that we might know the power of love. Let us now give with that same abandon to proclaim God's wonderful works in Christ to the world. We invite the ushers to come forward to gather our gifts. pray with me. Faithful God, you have kept your promises to us. Our lives give witness to your abundant blessings. May we faithfully keep our promises to you. Strengthen our commitment to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ, and, and may your love sustain us, guide us, and empower us. Lord, receive these gifts as signs of our promise to give ourselves completely to your care, to live without fear, and to trust your love without reservation. In Jesus' name, amen.
a band of angels coming after me. Come and walk to carry me home. My Lord, oh, yes, yes, I love I'm uh, reminded of the time that uh, there was a preacher who was uh, preaching on the evils of drink. And at the conclusion of the service, he said, you know, I think that all of you should, should uh, empty all of your, your whiskey uh, in the river. And immediately after that, the choir rose and, and sang, Shall We Gather at the River? <laughs> And that, came to, that story came to mind because it just occurred to me that uh, just before I get up to preach, the choir is singing, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Um, so. Well, it was, uh, it was an ordinary day of commuting for Cameron Halipeter. Um He was a 20-year-old uh, film student and he made his way down the steps of the subway uh, in New York City to uh, wait for the train. Well, all of a sudden, something went horribly wrong in this young man's brain, uh, sending him into a violent seizure. And uh, how Peter fell to the ground, he, he got back up, he began stumbling around along the edge of the subway platform, and moments later, he tumbled down into the railway bed just as the rumbling of an approaching train began to shake the whole station. Now, nobody managed to capture this on video, but we know how the people in the subway station probably reacted. You know, probably some of them just turned away, you know, eyes clenched against the horror of what was going to happen. Other commuters, you know, just stood frozen, you know, in a sense of, uh, of helplessness. Uh, others were in such a hurry to get where they needed to go that they missed the moment altogether. In mere seconds, a young man with dreams of becoming a Hollywood producer someday would meet an unthinkably violent end, and nobody could stop it. Nobody would stop it, except the one man who did. A 50-year-old construction worker named Wesley Autry did the unthinkable. Autry crossed the boundary of horror that withered all those others in the subway, while others were acted uh, as if they had concrete shoes, you know, that made them freeze. He got his feet moving. He stepped over that 
barrier of hurry, despite, despite being busy taking his two daughters home before he went to work, and this middle-aged black man from Harlem, who had little in common with a white Harvard student, chose to do what no one else on the scene elected to do. He chose to cross over. Autry strode along the subway platform and he jumped down into that ditch and covered Halpeter's bloodied, writhing body with his own. He held Halpeter down against the ground while the subway train thundered over them. And later, when interviewed about the incident, Autry said that, you know, when he saw the headlights of the number one train appear, he knew he had to make a split-second decision. And he said, I don't feel like I did anything spectacular. I just saw somebody who needed help. And I did what I felt was right. You're supposed to come to people's rescue. Well, there's something about that story of Autry and Hollipeter that both inspires us and kind of convicts us. On one hand, we are in awe of Mr. Autry's amazing act of risk-taking love. And we think, wow, you know, if everyone cared for others to that degree, this world would be a much different place. And on the other hand, we wonder, would I have taken a risk like that for a complete stranger? And from then, we go on to ask, and should Mr. Autry have taken a risk like that? After all, what would have happened to his two daughters if he had been hurt or killed? Shouldn't there be some limits to coming to the rescue at times like that? And so you can kind of hear the internal struggle going on in, uh, in the midst of that debate. And you can also hear the internal struggle going on in the words of a man who came to Jesus one day with a, with a question in our scripture reading. So we're going to hear the, the setting for the parable Jesus tells in this passage as uh, Matt reads to us First of all, from Matthew, Luke 10, verses 25 to 29. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? So do you sense the conflicting desires at work within this lawyer? On one hand, he wants to do the right thing. And he's like probably all those commuters standing in the subway platform. They wanted to do the right thing. And... He's like any one of us. If someone came up to you and asked, you know, would you like to change the world with risk-taking love? Most of you would answer, sign me up. But then a second impulse would move within you, just as it did within that lawyer. This second impulse asks, but what would that really mean in practice? You know, what would that cost me specifically? Uh, surely you're not talking about jumping in front of a train for a stranger or something crazy like that. There have to be some boundaries to what I would be required to do. I'll, I'll be glad to follow the law of love as long as it's coupled with the law of limits. So tell me, who's my neighbor? But Jesus goes on to tell the, the lawyer a story, which starts in verses 30 to 32. In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. 
So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side as well. So given the fact that these were religious men, these when the ones that went around, people who were more familiar than the average commuter that a law of love was to be at work in Israel. It's not completely clear why they did what they did. And Jesus doesn't really tell us. You know, maybe they were just too horrified by the sight of this beaten up man to, to do anything. Perhaps they, they felt helpless to do what was needed. Maybe they were so hurried in life over what they felt were more important matters. And perhaps they were just hardened by the ways of the world, a, way, a world where people of different races don't really rush to one another's aid all that often. That's why things like what happened next in the story still make the front page of the news, like the story in New York City did. But let's hear from verses 33 to 37. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So Jesus is so honest in this parable about how expensive compassion can be. You know, people talk very sentimentally or uh, very idealistically about compassion, but getting close to those who are hurting almost always costs us something emotionally. I mean, working with other people's wounds invariably gets very messy. Uh, investing in people in pain will take us off of our normal schedule. Crossing over will be an inconvenience to us. It, it will cost us money or other precious resources. It may subject us to entanglements that go on for a long time. The documentary film The Dropbox tells the remarkable story of Jean Jean Rock, a, a pastor of uh, Juicerang Community Church in Seoul. And Juicerang is a, a Korean word that means God's love. Um, Seoul, South, uh, South Korea. Now, worldwide, there are millions of children who are abandoned at birth. But in South Korea, where there's a very strict social code, the problem is especially acute, and it's growing. Unwanted children are often left to die in an alley or a street corner or dumped in a trash bin. But occasionally... They're, they're left on someone's doorstep. When some of those unwanted newborns started being placed on Pastor Lee's church steps, he decided to take action. He and his wife, spurred by their Christian faith and their experience of raising a son with extreme disabilities, began to take in these children. And because of the long, cold winters in South Korea, he eventually built a drop box in, front of, in the front wall of the church with a door that opens to the outside and one that opens to the inside as well. It's like a, a baby-sized drawer complete with a, a light bulb, heater, and a loud bell that alerts his family when a baby is placed in the box. And today, Pastor Lee's family and a small group of volunteers provide a loving home to more than a dozen mildly to, to severely disabled children at a, at a time. And over the years, they have saved hundreds of abandoned newborns. Despite the enormous cost, the overwhelming amount of work, and the lack of any government funding, Pastor Lee and his family continue 
Night after night, Pastor Lee stays up listening for the alarm. And when a new baby arrives, he races downstairs, he bundles up the child, and he prays. Now, the director of the Dropbox, Brian Ivey, was transformed by making this film. He grew up in a, going to a church on Christmas and Easter and considering himself a Christian because, as he put it, I didn't smoke cigarettes and I watched Fox News with my mom. He said it was a decorative label. But witnessing Lee's sacrifice and compassion for these abandoned children changed his perspective. These kids were helpless, he said, and I realized I was broken and helpless too, and I needed to be rescued. Ivy actually went to South Korea to make a different movie, but once he met Pastor Lee and saw the work that he and his family and team were doing, he changed his plans and he produced the Dropbox. And in the process, he dedicated his own life to Christ. Last week, we talked about Jesus' words from Mark 8, 34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Crossing over requires denying that very self that we've often protected and maintained. To do what Wesley Autry or Pastor Lee or the Good Samaritan did means that we must die to self a little more. It means we must walk the way of Jesus. Now Jesus is not just telling a a quaint story here with a moral. He's telling us about the heart of God and his own mission. You know, Jesus is like the, the cosmic Samaritan, you know, he he didn't need to stop and attend to the needs of a bleeding world that mainly thumbed their noses at him. God could have rightly set a limit on how much he would do for us. But Jesus showed that the law of love is larger than the law of limits. Jesus did an amazing thing. He chose to cross over. He crossed that vast gulf between eternity and eternity and time. He crossed that vast road between the the holiness and perfection of heaven and the sinfulness and imperfection of humanity. He didn't stand on the edge of the ditch, so to speak, horrified and helpless and hurried and and hard-hearted. He jumped down into the tracks and he threw his body over the world and offered us a love without limits. That Jericho road Jesus describes in this parable is the road to Calvary. It's the way of the cross. The ditch from Jerusalem to Jericho is a very long one. There's a lot of people in it. And you see in your mind's eye the spouse or the child or the friend, the relative, the co-worker or a stranger in pain. And you hear the groans. You know, it can be difficult to notice them because human pain is so horrible that we've learned to close our ears to it. We feel so helpless sometimes and we can't imagine how how we could ever act. And we're in such a hurry and our hearts have grown hard. It's natural natural for us to confess our limit and simply pass by on the other side. But wouldn't you like to have the power and grace to overcome all of that and find a way to let love move you to do something, even if it's costly? Well, Jesus is the source of that power and that grace that we need. In Jesus Christ, God crossed over to save us. And I can almost imagine him saying, you know, I, I saw the, the headlights of that train of destruction barreling down on the world. I saw those people in the ditch, and I had to make a decision. I didn't feel like I did anything spectacular. I just saw people who needed help. I did what I felt was right. Love overcomes limits. You're supposed to come to people's rescue. The most important question is not, who is my neighbor? The critical question is, 
Will I be a person who is primarily ruled by a sense of love or by a sense of limits? You don't have to. You can accept the limits. No human law compels you to cross over to the person in that ditch that you're going to meet sometime later this week. But if you do, if you choose to move toward that pain of others rather than around it, you'll be walking in the way of Jesus. You'll be on the crossroad. Let's pray together. Oh God, it is our heart's desire to follow Jesus. Even though that means denying ourselves, taking up a cross, and following him on the crossroad. Lord, when it comes down to the nitty-gritty of those who are, we will meet who are in pain this week, Lord, we ask for an extra measure of your courage, your grace, your love to empower us to do what uh, others will not. And in the name of Jesus, Lord, to follow you in the, the crossroad, the road of, of service that, um, that is indeed costly love. And so speak to our hearts, Lord. Um, help us to see where we, we see ourselves in this parable. And um, Lord, work within us. We want to follow you. And so change our hearts to make us more like you. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and join in our uh, closing hymns. <laughs> Yesu, Yesu. Thank you.